Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm John Chorcheri. I'm a, a faculty affiliate at the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, and I teach at the Ford School. Uh, we are delighted today to welcome Jenna Grant from the University of Washington in Seattle. Jenna is an assistant professor of anthropology there, uh, but she has a really exciting uh, and engaging research agenda that crosses over into a number of disciplines. She works in medical and visual anthropology. She works in science and technology, uh, health care issues, gender issues. Importantly for our purposes, she also has an area studies focus uh, and is very knowledgeable about Southeast Asia and particularly Cambodia, uh, which will be the subject of her talk today. Um, some of her recent work uh, has also touched on Cambodia, such as a very interesting piece that I read on, on how it is that, uh, uh, that we interpret images, an, ethno an ethnographic study uh, looking at an expectant mother and how she interpreted uh, an ultrasound image that she received in black and white and what kind of cultural and personal significance that it had for her in the context in which she was viewing it. Uh, she's also done recent work on uh, issues of general interest to anybody in anthropology or other social sciences on open access to medical anthropology studies and the data underlying them and some of the benefits that can provide in terms of dissemination of access to knowledge, but also some of the ethical <coughs> conundrum that that can present. Uh, and that relates to another recent publication that she has, which is related to the theme of today's talk, uh, on ethical issues that have arisen uh, in uh, bioethics issues that have arisen in connection with a controversial clinical trial for HIV treatment in Cambodia. So please, everybody, join me in welcoming Jenna to the University of Michigan and to the Center of Southeast Asian Studies. Thank you. How's the sound? Is it okay? Okay. Thanks for the lovely introduction. I'm really impressed that you read some <laughs> of those essays. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation from the Center for Southeast Asian Studies and uh, the Science and Technology Studies Program and the Department of Anthropology. I'm really thrilled to be here. I haven't been on this campus before, so it's a treat for sure. Okay. So over the past decade and a half, an increasing number of clinical trials have been conducted in Cambodia. The country is a source of data about HIV, malaria, diabetes, and other conditions. One can view these details about these experiments in the U.S. government's clinicaltrials.gov database. A search for Cambodia brings up 75 entries. These trials involve an array of actors. There are governments, like the U.S. government, the National Institutes of Health, and the French government uh, Institutes for Development and HIV and Hepatitis Research. There are specific research institutes, such as the Institut Pasteur, the Belgian Institute of Tropical Medicine, universities like the University of British Columbia, Oxford University, Mahidol, and Bangkok, foundations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Family Health International, multilateral organizations like the World Health Organization, UNICEF, Military, such as the U.S. Armed Forces Research Institute for Medical Sciences, or AFRIMS, and pharmaceutical companies like Bayer and Gilead. So some of the interventions in these trials include screening trials, drug trials, health education, behavior change, nutritional supplement, supplements, and studying consumer approaches to risk in the case of a health insurance study. And in addition to the big three of HIV, malaria, and tuberculosis, the diseases and conditions studied include malnutrition, <coughs> anemia, bacterial infections, hepatitis, phantom limb pain, lower limb prostheses, cancer of the breast, uterus, and cervix, soil transmitted helminths. Most of these trials work with the institutes in the Cambodian Ministry of Health. So Cambodia is a source of data about diseases and problems, providing biological materials, uh, evidence of different human behaviors. It's also a context for research. But does Cambodia as a context shape the practice of the clinical trials? And if so, how and which way, in which ways and to what effects? So in this talk, I explore this question of how context shapes scientific practices through the case of Cambodia's first experimental trial, the Cambodia Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis Trial, or the PREP trial. This was, an, uh, this was a part of a, a large number of trials around the globe at the time in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South America, um, also in Thailand. 
Um, this trial in Cambodia, though, was canceled before it started officially enrolling subjects. In Cambodia, activists, media, and the prime minister configured research in terms of national identities. Categories of Cambodian and non-Cambodian became tethered to relationships of extreme material difference and potential for exploitation. I argue that this shifts the object of concern of classical bioethics from the experimental subject to the relation between the researchers and the subjects. Bioethicists and practitioners, social scientists, are consumed with this question of how to locally tailor research. In classical bioethics, the rights are universal, but the techniques of ensuring those rights vary by context. And so for the case of informed consent, for example, this could be how best to inform participants, how to talk about the notion of placebo, how, whether to differentiate uh, between research and health care, re whether relatives or bosses must also consent to participate. So the concept of the local context has typically been focused on sort of the subject or the setting, with the researcher outside of the frame and somewhat abstract. Within the debates about the Cambodia PrEP trial, however, I think a different configuration of bioethics came into relief, involving both the researcher and the subject. Debates about the ethics of the trial invoked research ethics guidelines, relations of vulnerability and responsibility between foreigners and Cambodians and between Cambodian leaders and subjects. So ethics takes shape within seemingly global forms, like the circulation of committees, forms of activism and advocacy, but also what I will describe as local repertoires of contention following So King Ao, um, in terms of appealing to a Cambodian leader and also the particular forms and ambiguities that human rights discourse takes in Cambodia post-conflict. So in a recent article in Social Studies of Science, I developed the notion of a post-colonial bioethics. And what I meant was that it's sort of as a post-colonial as a shorthand um, as, uh, for a conjuncture, not specifically about a category of agency or about kinds of expertise, but encapsulating these global circulations and, um, and, and local forms together. And I borrow this term, sort of the field of articulation from an urban studies theorist, Ananya Roy. But also within science studies, there's a lot of interest in co-production. We have a lot of tools within um, science and technologies studies to think about the relational co-production of categories and also within post-colonial studies. So I'm interested in how these may come together, right? how we can think of them together. Um, as Idi Abraham stresses, though, in post-colonial studies, if one can speak more generally about this field, there's a foregrounding of this unequal but simultaneous co-production. So this focus on inequity is, is there, right? The simultaneity and the unequal co-production. So as such, the field of articulation of bioethics in the Cambodia PrEP trial is specific to Cambodia, its histories of disease and subjugation, its practices of public health and contention, and to HIV activism and global health science, whose specificities are not defined by the ge geography of the nation state. So thus, the configuration of research and ethics, Cambodian and foreign, happens within this field. And borrowing from uh, literary studies and Buddhist studies scholar Ashley Thompson, she was talking about um, understanding the refugee crisis in the late 80s and early 90s, and she was saying we need to understand the specificity of this situation in Cambodia, but also how do we relate this to other refugee crises um, that are happening around the world at that time that may seem equivalent in some ways. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. This is a brief uh, plan for the talk, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the resources that I use from Southeast Asia studies about science and medicine, um, and also try to set the stage a bit uh, for global health research, particularly at this time in the early 2000s and the prominence of HIV and controversies around ethics, and then talk uh, a little bit about PrEP um, in Cambodia, but also as a, as a now a very normalized um, prevention mechanism within the US. OK. <clears throat> and then I'll explore what was at the heart of the article, which was um, what I see as this conjuncture of human rights with post-colonial nationhood that makes a reformulation of bioethics um, kind of in, in the middle of all these circulating domains. Okay, so to start then, uh, I've really enjoyed going back to this book, which I read a while ago, Siam Mapped. Have, have people read this book? I'm sure some of the Thai studies folks have. And, um, 
But Tong Chai Wen Chakwa was a historian, and this book covers the talks about the um, scientific practices of mapping and geography in sort of the mid to late 1800s and into the early 1900s, and in the context of Siam, arguing that these scientific practices are central to identifying with the nation, what he says identifying with nationhood. Um, Tong Chai talks about two di different ways of identifying what he calls a positive identification that uh, is through similarity and maybe flattening differences within Siam between different groups, ethnic groups or religious groups. Um, and then a negative identification, which is uh, defining the nation and the nationhood as what it, against what it is not, against an other. Um, and this, it's the second meaning that is also applicable, I think, in this case and in other parts of Southeast Asia. So a quote from the book is, the discourse of a foreign enemy is the magic box to generate the discourse of the nation. Um, <clears throat> a historian, Sokeng Ao, has written a great book um, and, and also a, a shorter article. I highly encourage you to read it if you haven't. Um, about uh, biomedicine during the early 1900s uh, in Cambodia. And what Ao um, emphasizes is that the introduction of biomedicine comes at the time of colonialism um, and that the, it's institutionalized. Uh, in the assistance medical, and that the during this time, particularly her analysis of the plague is shows how these in these experimental moments where the etiology of the plague was not known, um, and so it's being worked out in French Indochina and in France. Um, that uh, there's there's uncertainties both for colonial medical practitioners and for Cambodian leads and Cambodian subjects. Um, and this, I think, is another parallel we can make to the, the situation of the prep trial. Um, and what she calls is, this is a contingent nature of modernity. So, quote, the process of medical modernization was being experienced simultaneously by colonizer and colonized, creating conflicts within the European community, as well as between European and indigenous population. The other thing that's useful in her analysis is what she calls um, repertoires of contention. So how people would um, sort of challenge or criticize medical practices of the assistance medical. Um, and she talks about protest, uh, petition, and then also evasion, literally leaving the city where um, different interventions were being rolled out. Um, but also that these forms, particularly the petition, which I'll focus on later, involve making uh, a moral claim to a Cambodian leader. So not petitioning the French uh, colonial service, but going to the Cambodian leaders to say, this is, this is not right. We need you to intervene. Um, so just a brief political timeline to hopefully illustrate the multiplicity of political regimes since independence in 1953. And with these, come with these different political regimes come different ways the co government is organizing public health um, and different foreign um, kinds of interventions. Uh, on the right are covers of uh, one of the first medical journals in Cambodia, which was um, began publication in 1960, and it was co-authored with Soviet and, uh, and Cambodian uh, doctors and translators um, in French. And you can see sort of at different moments during the Cold War, different powers being involved in public health. So just to emphasize that the foreign, the public health has been a domain of foreign presence for a long time. <clears throat> so the PrEP trial comes um, during the last period on the slide, the Kingdom of Cambodia, but it comes at a moment after roughly 30 years of conflict um, where their structures are stabilized enough to collaborate in a, the way that's required, say, by the US government on these trials. Um, and, then, and the diseases in Cambodia are of interest to international researchers. And also NGOs, kind of in this period of 1992 to 93, NGOs come into the country, um, and uh, foreign NGOs, but also local NGOs, are founded to promote democracy and human rights and to prepare for an election. And the NGO is also a, a really big um, actor in the health field. Many services are provided by NGOs um, working with the Ministry of Health or on their own. So it's sort of after this period that I see human rights and health as being merged as a discourse of moral force. <clears throat> 
Um, so also during this uh, early 2000s time period is um, really the rise of certain institutions within global health and global health science. You see the beginning of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Global Fund for um, AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and um, large-scale collaborations that have been described by Ving Kim Nguyen and um, many others, Richard Waldenberg. Uh, between different entities, some of which I discussed in the beginning. Um, but HIV prevention is a field where there are a lot of contests about the kinds of research that are happening across um, as uh, transnational research and where norms of health and human rights and gender and sexuality are also being challenged. So there's, it's a really um, uh, potent sort of domain uh, for debates uh, that are not limited to kind of a disease in a narrow sense, right? And this has become much more of the norm in the way we talk about HIV. So these are just a few of the books within anthropology, uh, critical medical anthropology for the most part, um, and three of the four in, b based in Africa that have looked at HIV, um, the politics of research, the kinds of collaborations, um, and also what these norms of health care um, what it is to be healthy, what it is to provide a good standard of care um, are analyzed in some of these books, like by Johanna Crane um, and Adia Benton. So now I'll just talk a bit more about PrEP and the trial in Cambodia. So in the early and mid-2000s, the first wave of PrEP trials were being planned or underway in Africa, Asia, North and South America. PrEP trials were designed to test the safety and efficacy of the antiretroviral drug tenofovir for prevention of HIV prevention, infection. Excuse me. This drug is manufactured by Gilead Sciences, and it was already in use as treatment in some parts of the world. So the question that the trial was asking, can this treatment, which has been in use, also prevent infection following exposure? Can it prevent HIV from being taken up in the body? Um, PrEP trials involve different funders and implementing institutions and different study populations. So um, in some countries, injection drug users, in other countries, heterosexual couples, in others, gay men, and as in Cambodia, uh, female sex workers. So the Cambodia PrEP trial began in 2003 when researchers from the University of California, San Francisco, and the University of New South Wales, funded by the U.S. National Institute of Health and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, entered into collaboration with the Cambodian National Center for HIV AIDS, Dermatology, and Sexually Transmitted Infections, which is part of the Ministry of Health. The objective was to determine whether tenofovir was safe and effective for prevention of HIV in female sex workers. It was a randomized double-blind placebo trial that recruited was going to recruit 960 women. The prevalence in Cambodia at the time was understood to be 2.6%, which was the highest uh, in Asia at that point in time. And sex workers had a prevalence between 19 and 31%, which was made them a group that had already been targeted for surveillance and intervention, such as a 100% condom use program is one example. Um, but at that time, tenofovir and antiretrovirals were not widely available in Cambodia, and that's important. The most vocal critics of the PrEP trial were two related groups, the Women's Network for Unity. So I've had the kind of the actors in blue and then some of the work that's being done in pink, just tried to map some of the complexities of this trial. But the Women's ne Network for Unity up at the top um, and the Women's Agenda for Change, the women that, Women's Network for Unity is a union of current and former sex workers and the Women's Agenda for Change was a local offshoot of Oxfam Hong Kong. Um, Ox, uh, the Women's Agenda for Change had mobilized around what the neoliberal development, so they were really active in debt bondage programs, uh, criticizing debt bondage programs, what they saw in Cambodia. Um, but, and it's also important to say that the landscape for NGOs was quite fractured at the time because um, in order to re receive funding from the U.S. government, uh, NGOs had to take an anti-prostitution pledge, and this put NGOs working with sex workers in a difficult position because they're saying that they're against sex work, but yet they're trying to serve sex workers. Um, so the Women's Agenda for Change was the only NGO who refused to sign that. Um, and so there were already debates going on as to who, would, who could speak for the community, right? Who was the, the representative? <coughs> so the main concerns about the trial from these two groups were that the rights of sex workers would not be protected and the WNU was not consulted. 
as a as a important representative of the community. The WNU and WAC shared membership, so I'm mostly going to say WNU, but they actually did many things together. Um, that there were no provisions for long-term care should tenofovir have side effects, and what they asked for was 30 years of post-trial insurance. Um, and there was no guarantee that they would have access to the drug if it turned out that it worked, so the, they felt that Cambodians were being asked to take on the risk but maybe would not receive the benefits. Um, at this time, PrEP researchers were collaborating with other sex worker NGOs. Many of these organizations wanted to work with the trial. Um, and they didn't address these concerns publicly. Um, they emphasized that they were abiding by guidelines, if not exceeding them, and sort of setting new standards for, for research. They emphasized the voluntary nature of participation, that care would be provided during the trial, and that there was no funding for long-term health insurance, and this wasn't part of the mandate of the research. They agreed to provide two years of post-trial care, but argued that significant benefits like 30 years of care would be undue inducement. I'll talk a little bit more about this concept of how undue inducement came into play. Um, they did get agreement from the Global Fund in Gilead to have to not to access tenofovir at re reduced prices, and they also built a clinic and a laboratory and trained clinical staff, ethics staff, um, security staff, a large number of people in preparation for the trial. So in August 2004, during a hospital groundbreaking ceremony, the Cambodian Prime Minister, Sandak Hun Sen, spoke against the trial. Cambodia is not a trash bin country, he said. So far, they've tested Cambodians with antiretroviral drugs. They should not conduct experiments with Cambodians. They should do it with animals. The speech came as a surprise to the researchers and health officials and NGO staff with whom I spoke. The trial preparations stopped, and speaking publicly about the trial became a liability, putting particularly Cambodian researchers and the Cambodian NGOs that were collaborating in a difficult position. And the following years, in 2005, the PrEP trials in Cameroon, Nigeria, and Malawi were suspended. Some of the other trials that were going on at the time continued, like in Peru and Thailand and the US. In Thailand, it was also quite there were a, lot, a number of concerns. But in 2012, the US FDA approved Truvada, which is a combination of tenofovir and emtricitabine for use as PrEP. And the WHO and the European Commission have endorsed PrEP for use of prevention of HIV in high-risk groups. So there's still fierce debate about the ethics of PrEP. Should medicine be provided for HIV-negative people for prevention rather than to HIV-positive people for treatment? Um, there's debate about adherence and resistance, privileging pharmaceutical over behavioral prevention methods, and norms of sexuality and gender. And as I mentioned, in the US, PrEP has become normalized. There's an app where you can locate PrEP-friendly providers. Um, uh, you can access that from the CDC website there. Vice magazine has made documentaries about it, so it's become kind of a mainstream thing. I don't know if those are the two ways to judge <laughs> normalization, but um, OK. So despite the, the, this uh, kind of acceptance of PrEP in some circles, the, the questions, I think, still are pressing. So in the one hand, what I'm talking about is a historical moment about PrEP and about global health. But in the other, these questions about spending money on research versus care are still very much with us, I think, in global health. We're still wrestling with this. And many of the countries that participated in the trials that demonstrated the efficacy of PrEP as prevention still don't have access to it. So there's, it's, it's, it's a, and this was a while ago that the trials occurred. Um, so one of the new social forms that came with this trial was the National Ethics Committee for Health Research in Cambodia. Uh, the PrEP trial researchers were involved in training um, the Ethics Committee, which is part of the Ministry of Health. And uh, a few years before, this began around 2002, and a few years before, some key ethics documents were translated into Khmer, like the Declaration of Helsinki and others. So there's this, a, a moment of um, really increasing institutionalization of ethics and also pan-Asian workshops on bioethics, and in 2001, there's an international journal, Developing World Bioethics, that also addresses many of the issues that were under um, debate at the time, and still does. 
So the trial protocol was approved by ethical review boards in Cambodia, the US, and Australia. However, instead of finding confidence in the three levels of review, the WNU argued that the review boards were essentially redundant, as they were people by individuals from the researchers' home countries, or individuals trained by the researchers. They thought the review boards would be biased in favor of the researchers and not motivated to understand or protect the interest of sex workers. So in addition to this institutional form, the trial also brings forward new social actors, such as the patient expert, if people are familiar, for example, with Stephen Epstein's work, but also works on lay health activism. There's, this, is, this was a newer form in Cambodia at the time, too, where the patient, by nature of being a patient, is thought to have a special kind of expertise that also deserves to be recognized in the planning of research, right? So this comes forward, um, as well as forms of activism, um, Again, the kind of a canonical study by Steve Epstein in, in Pure Science shows how activists um, it did community education, but also confrontational protest and sort of learning the languages of science, learning the virology and immunology, protesting, and then was were sort of many different strategies were the ways with which US AIDS activists were able to influence the, the conduct of science at the time. Um, so the, the WNU conducted similar types of education to, for researchers. They had pamphlets for sex workers. They had pamphlets for community members. Um, they tried to dictate the ways to, to conduct an ethical trial, such as contact community groups, establish a community advisory board. Um, they educated sex workers that they have the right to confidentiality, the right to information about side effects. Um, if you've participated in research, I know when I was uh, in college, it's a, like a fertile ground for <laughs> recruitment of research subjects. But you usually have to go through a consent process of some kind, right? And so some of these similar questions are there. Um, so, but but these the education and the um, emphasizes a feeling of vulnerability and the unknown, right? That, that this is that this is a right. Um, and it was interesting when the paper uh, in social studies of, of science was reviewed. I think this point was lost on actually the editor who's like, why is it special to ask about side effects? This is just a normal thing. And I was like, no, there wasn't, this wasn't, this was novel, right, to ask about this. This was not the typical conversation one would have with a doctor or a drug seller or a pharmacist, right? Um, okay, so this is intentionally blank for a little bit. So in, ten, in addition to community education then, um, the WNU's main tactic was to emphasize the unequal relations between the researchers and funders on the one hand and the participant community on the other. At the heart of these references was the implication that the health and well-being of Cambodians would be exploited at the hands of non-Cambodians. This sentiment resonated with the actions of the prime minister, the headlines of the local press, and in my conversations with NGO staff. So at the time, PrEP researchers told me they were aware of this concern about exploitation, but they did not address it publicly, and they didn't talk about it as a relationship which, within which they were implicated. They saw it as like, oh, maybe Gilead or, or Gates, but, but that they themselves were part of this relationship was not a part of a public discussion. Um, they viewed their research as a form of activism, uh, moving the site of knowledge production to the place where the disease was and trying to build capacity, as one researcher said, so that people could participate in this global community of science, um, training researchers to produce knowledge about themselves. So how do participant rights then become Cambodian rights? How do research ethics become a way to talk about relations of responsibility and vulnerability and sovereignty? Enactments of participant rights as Cambodian rights involve a media that's fixated on exploitation, this petition as a historical form of anti-colonial protest, and the ambiguity of human rights discourse in post-conflict times when perpetrators and protectors shift roles. So the prominence of rights-related discourse can be traced to this period following UNTAC in 1992 and 93. Hun Sen and his government have had an uneasy relationship with human rights discourse, to put it mildly, I'd say. Um, initially critical of it as lenient on criminals and threatening to bring chaos to a fragile post-conflict society, and more recently challenging it as a form of Western imperialism or hypocrisy. 
In typical human rights discourse in Cambodia, the imagined or explicit perpetrators of abuses are the military or the state or powerful elites. In the WNU and WAC articulations of rights in the PrEP trial, the potential perpetrators of abuse are foreigners, foreign researchers. A shift in this perpetrator from the state and elites to the foreign researcher accompanies an expansion then of the category of the victim from the subject to people, the Cambodian people. The leader is no longer the perpetrator. He's obligated to be the protector of the people. So this concept of post-colonial bioethics captures how global health research is articulated within these other idioms of vulnerability and responsibility. The WNU called a press conference in March 2004, and the background statement contains a range of points that um, that show a complex portrait of possible abuses to women in an already precarious situation. I won't read through all of these, but just to emphasize that there's an experimentation on the poor, on poor Cambodian sex workers, that Cambodian sex workers are not themselves just individuals in, in the face of the trial, but they also, uh, their families are implicated in their participation. If something happens to them, it, it can affect their community. Um, again, People in richer countries and the drug company may benefit, and that researchers might leave when the trial's over, right? So the, the omission also of the Cambodian researchers and Cambodian um, NGOs is interesting here, right? Because it, it makes this split to return to Tong Chai Wanishakalo again, kind of the we self sort of created through the othering, right? In making reference to those not immediately involved in the study, the WNU asserts that the PrEP trial has broad social consequences. Sreilak, a coordinator for an HIV AIDS NGO that works with sex workers, conveyed this in terms of the researcher's responsibility to the community. Quote, if the results of taking tenofovir are negative, then it will become a burden in their community, end quote. So why might Cambodians be guinea pigs? Ruin, a staff member at an NGO that works with sex workers and migrant laborers, asked this question rhetorically and then answered it. She wondered if a developing country such as Cambodia might be attractive for research not, because of, not only because of high HIV prevalence, but also because laws are not enforced. This was a conversation I had with her in 2005. She said, when we heard about the trial, we start thinking, why choose Cambodia to be the country to pilot tenofovir? And I said, well, what do you think, why? She said, we think that it's because Cambodia is one of the countries that has an HIV epidemic. But another reason, my personal idea, is that we're still a developing country. And I said, so why is a developing country matter in this case? She said, for the company who produces the medicine, it may be difficult to convince a developed country to pilot the project. And the number of people living with HIV AIDS may be small. In contrast, in Cambodia, we have a high prevalence, and our policies are still not maintained strictly. People can come to our country, they can say something that's not contained in the law. So I think this statement highlights the sense that there's no entity protecting ordinary citizens. The Cambodian government is unable to provide protection, or according to some of the people I talked to, they think the government is unwilling to provide protection. And foreigners may not come with the best intentions. So this concern about responsibility and a concern about ex exploitation is also a concern about a lack of protection, right, from exploitation. And Hun Sen, the prime minister, taking a stand on the trial can be seen as a move to kind of bolster his image as the protector of the people. Local papers uh, in, in Cambodia emphasize the conflict between unequal actors. So some of the titles of the articles at the time were researchers threatened to bypass the sex union, or sex workers threatened to block Bill Gates' HIV study. Sex workers stand firm on Bill Gates' drug trial. These give a sense of a David and Goliath type conflict between participants and funders. The name of one of the richest men in the world highlights the extreme disparity between researchers and participants and suggests a question. Why does a US mogul provide money for research but not for healthcare for Cambodian sex workers? While central to the WNU and media accounts, the researchers did not address this issue beyond the notion of undue inducement. Richard is an Australian researcher, a physician, and epidemiologist, and he discussed the concept of undue inducement with me, and then he questioned it. He said, quote, people should join a trial not expecting that there's anything in it for them that would be undue inducement for them to enter the trial. Offering somebody a lifetime of medical insurance, which might seem like a nice solution, but then people can't afford, when they can't afford bread or rice, this is obviously a huge inducement, and you have people flocking to join the study because they know they're going to get that. And that's unethical. 
then he paused and he said, that's decided to be unethical. Maybe we need to revisit that. I don't know. These are complex questions. I haven't seen a good answer, end quote. So Richard's statement reveals that he's aware that international guidelines and standards, such as the decision about ethics of post-trial care, are constructed and subject to change. However, his acknowledgment that these guidelines are open to interpretation and negotiation was voiced in private to me. And it was this was never a public discussion. But I think the concept of undue inducement is reflects a particular idea, idealized idea of what research is and how it should proceed, right? That there people should be willing kind of the rational actor receives information and then decides sort of based on the risks and benefits. But but um, in many cases, there the inducements are <laughs> might be not having access to care, right? Again, it's this question of what is the relationship that the research is entering into and either amplifying or changing or shifting in some way. So in some sense, the concept of undue inducement, I think, is related to a particular way of thinking about objectivity and research, right, and the way of... Um, the intervention uh, being isolated from other conditions. So in speaking against the trial, Hansen positioned himself as acting to protect the rights and well-being of the Cambodian people. In fact, he did not mention the specific population for the study, the sex workers. And he has a, it's his forte to um, speak against uh, developed world incursions into the developing world. Um, uh, so when the WNU was concerned that after Hansen canceled the trial that, that the researchers were trying to start, start it again, and they sent a letter, um, a public letter to Hansen. They said, we the vulnerable people of Cambodia would like to express our deep thankfulness to the prime minister who has supported us in stopping the unethical trial of an HIV prevention drug last August. Samdek is a true father who always has compassion and is very thoughtful about the benefits to his children and stays with us when we are in difficulty. Dear Prime Minister, after articulating their concerns about researchers pressuring, pressuring sex workers to participate, this was the idea. It's not, again, it's not clear uh, what was happening. Um, they concluded their letter by linking their words to what Hun Sen said in 2004. They said, every Cambodian has the right to live to participate, to make decisions, but the research group does not give us these rights. They only think about their benefits and exploits us, the poor and powerless. Cambodian people are not waste, and Cambodia is not a waste bin. We would like to thank you for your meaningful statement. We would like to wish you good health and that you stay in power to continue to govern and lead Cambodia to peace and development. So both the WNU and Hun Sen articulate this we as Cambodians more generally, not sex workers specifically. The discourse asserting Cambodians are not waste or guinea pigs is a claim to the same rights, the same dignity, and the same freedom as non-Cambodians. This letter is a form of politics in Cambodia with deep roots. As I mentioned earlier, Sokeng Ao has described a petitioning of the king used to resist French colonial medical policies surrounding plague control. Petitioning could take the form of a demonstration at the residence of the king or a letter to the king detailing grievances. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in present day Cambodia, the king has lost political and perhaps moral power, and it is common to petition the prime minister instead, Hun Sen. As Penny Edwards has noted, Hun Sen's taking the title Samdek in the mid 1990s was a claim to the moral authority and semi divinity of the king. This moral authority can take paternalistic form <coughs> following the precedent set by the previous king, Sihanouk, who often referred to himself as the father of his people. The WNU combined local forms of protest then, such as petitioning the Cambodian leader using this father-child rhetoric with strategies of international activism like teach-ins and press conferences, which use a quite different discourse of empowerment. These images are from uh, protests in 2013 um, around a land issue at Bunkak Lake in Phnom Penh. Um, but I, I include them because there's a photograph of Hun Sen on the left side at the top and then a photograph of his wife just to illustrate because the protesters went to his house and they held pictures of him and it was a way of appealing um, to try to make a moral claim for justice to the, the minister against, in this case it was a development company that was filling in the lake and evicting people. So here the resolution of concerns about the trial uh, really moves beyond the scope of adherence to guidelines, right, ethics guidelines. It moves into this other realm that includes histories and active national narratives of predation upon Cambodians by foreigners. 
So to much of the world, recent Cambodian history might be defined by the Khmer Rouge era. But it's worth noting that in Cambodia, there's an active, it, people speak much more about exploitation by foreign others. Um, and Or it's as prominent, at least, in the imaginary. Hun Sen has cultivated this persona of standing strong against Western moral imperialism. So this simplified narrative of threat to sovereignty from abroad or from others within requires this continuous fashioning. Biomedical research framed as an exploitive relationship between foreigners and Cambodia hooks into these imaginaries in Cambodia. The we self must be maintained. And the translation of rights, uh, human rights into the rights of researchers works for Hun Sen because of this shift in the imagined or potential perpetrator from the state to the foreign researchers. Because recall that Hun Sen did not speak much about the rights of Kim. He wasn't interested in human rights discourse very much, particularly in the 90s, right? And still, but he can use it when the victor, the victim and the perpetrator are shifted. Um, So as we know from decades of scholarship in science and technology studies, controversies are a potent site to study the values and practices of science. They're sites where things are not settled and under debate. So what is the right way to proceed? What are the facts that we take to be true? Who has the authority to contribute? The work of Steve Epstein and Sohir Morsi, who's a medical anthropologist that's worked in Egypt primarily, show how publics participate in debates about science by grounding participation in some form of expertise. In many STS studies, it's often implicit that scientific or technical expertise has a broad cultural authority. We can see how cultural authority of expertise <coughs> cannot be taken for granted. The WNU's demand for 30 years of health insurance in a country that had only scattered health insurance schemes is either very strong bargaining or really rejection of the trial itself. The WNU made the relationship between resource-rich and resource-constrained countries central to the trial. They did so through idioms of foreign intervention, the responsibility of leaders and human rights, as opposed to an idiom of good science, right? which is um, one of the themes in many STS studies, is how to make a better science. So my objectives have been to illuminate how post-colonial concerns with rights, with vulnerability and sovereignty, configure authoritative grounds for participation in these scientific controversies. So now, almost a decade later, we inhabit these futures that the debates around the PrEP trial helped to shape. Um, HIV prevention guidelines have been revised uh, since these PrEP controversies and others, and they now really focus on engaging communities um, in, within the guidelines. They also acknowledge inequalities as a presenting particular kinds of challenges for research that need to be addressed. So these are now explicitly kind of objectified within HIV prevention research guidelines in particular. The Declaration of Helsinki, uh, somewhat controversially, also includes a statement about the need to consider post-trial care. Um, that was a, a lot of debate about that provision. Um, in 2005, an international group of researchers and clinicians and activists published a statement in Science in support of the trials. And they argued for the need to test tenofovir's safety and efficacy in different groups, not just in, quote, Paris, San Francisco, or New York. Yet following the early controversies about PrEP, we could now ask, is there more than just the drug that's being tested in these trials? So I've suggested that the practice of research was also on trial, and that the PrEP trial, because it was the first major experimental trial in Cambodia, and a novel clinical trial for any location, the standards and the means to evaluate them were not set. Um, again, as So Kang Ao said, this contingent modernity was being forged here. Um, and Rosengarten and Michael, who are British and Australian medical anthropologists and who have written about PrEP, they, emphasize, they note that the emphasis on community consultation in recent guidelines may lead to new forms of knowledge and new forms of expertise. So I think the Cambodia PrEP trial is good to think with. The institutional and textual forms of bioethics, such as the National Ethics Community, Committee, translations of ethics guidelines, activist education pamphlets, press conferences, letters to political leaders, illustrate how bioethics takes shape within other idioms of vulnerability and sovereignty. So I've argued that the object of bioethics comes, becomes the relation between subjects and researchers rather than just the subject and the population itself. And that this is a simultaneous unequal, mm -hmm. it, this comes in the simultaneous and unequal expansion of global health at the time and 
as well as ongoing projects of post-conflict nationhood. So the global, global health research is entangled in producing this we self and the other, again to quote Tong Chai. Um, so I wanted to return to the clinical trials database. Um, this is a different view uh, where you can map the trials. Um, the red area is the region of Southeast Asia, but again, this was the search for any clinical trial happening in Cambodia. And what the numbers on the other countries show is the other countries where trials in Cambodia are also being conducted in other countries, and they're linked through these, these resources. So this view illuminates the global connections en enacted by clinical trials. Cambodia is connected to Algeria, Moldova, India, Korea, and the Philippines, among other countries, through Bayer's study of diabetes to Côte d'Ivoire for studies of HIV and malaria by French agencies, to Congo, Nepal, Sudan for studies of fever, to Kenya for malaria and diarrhea research, Bangladesh, dengue, to Brazil for study of helminths, cancers, and malaria. So in fact, malaria drug resistance is now one of um, the most studied conditions in Cambodia. And a, pro a new project that I'm developing is interested in understanding these entanglements of sort of biological and social complexity uh, with malaria drug resistance. So what you see, I'll just speak very briefly about this, um, uh, because I think it's an interesting case about how um, specificities in Cambodia are affecting the way science is practiced in other places, which is an interesting question for science studies, but also for Cambodia studies, um, the, that you see genetically distinct but emergences of resistance to malaria drugs in this uh, Cambodia Thai border region um, over the past 60 years. So the most recent one is the resistance to artemisinin-based drugs, which are really one of the standards, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, for treatment of um, falciparum malaria. And the the questions here are about the practices of drug taking over time. It involves questions about drug markets and also this particular border region. So why the scientific and so social and biological scientific question is why in the same place over and over have these different resistances emerged? What can we say? And uh, malaria scientists um, are really grappling with this complexity, uh, trying to understand the vec changes in the vector, in the human host, in the um, parasite and also in the environment. But it raises really interesting questions about um, history kind of affecting biology, right? And how history becomes biologized, what Hannah Landecker has called the biology of history. Um, another interest in mine is Phnom Penh as a site of production uh, uh, rather than a recipient of interventions, but is actually kind of formulating them and exporting them to the world. Um, so you can see some of again, to compare this map, but the Institute Pasteur is a key player here. And many of the scientists move between the um, s other Pasteur sites in Africa uh, to Cambodia and back. So there's this interesting circulation of, of people, of samples, <laughs> and of expertise um, that uh, trace lines established during the colonial period. OK, I'll stop now. So uh, thank you very much. Would the HIV programs in Cambodia have had any contact or relationship with those going on in Thailand and Vietnam on their sides, or does history block that as well? No, I, th I think there's been a relationship. There's relationships of the res for the research, but also of the activism. So the Tra Thai Drug Users Union was collaborating with the Sex Worker Union, but also the researchers move across the boundary. And um, they're quite different. Epidemics, at least at that time, in the early 2000s, it was m tended to be focused more with injection drug use in Vietnam and Thailand and more within female sex workers in Cambodia. There's been some shifts at that, but at that time, the, they looked quite different. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I was working for Women's Agenda for Change during this entire period. Oh, my goodness. And. Uh, uh, you didn't mention in, uh, one of the pieces of the 
uh, unethicality yep. issue, which was the fact that uh, many of the street people trying to recruit the uh, sex workers for the uh, experiment were in effect um, undermining the um, historical effort that had been made successfully to get sex workers to insist on the use of condoms and instead implying to people that the use of tenofovir was a substitute. Um, and that was in fact, uh, although it wasn't mentioned in Hun Sen's public position, was one of the things that sold him on opposing the, the thing was mm -hmm. that a lot of these young women w were giving up the use of condoms based on this experiment. And I'm wondering, are, were you aware of the phenomenon? Uh, uh, how do you think it figures into the analysis uh, uh, you've given us? I I think it's important. My understanding is that was more of a public debate in Nigeria, specifically about the counseling and how tenofovir was being explained, kind of what it can do, what it can't do. You still need to wear a condom. We don't know whether it works or not. There are actually some parallels with male circumcision and sort of some of the struggles about how to fit that into other prevention mechanisms. But I, um, I knew that that was an issue. That people discussed that, but I didn't think of that as one of the more central ones. But I, I mean, I see it as a point, important point. But it's, I would love to talk to you more about that afterwards, yeah. Hi, first of all, thank you, that was great. And I'm Thanks. so glad you're thinking about this Thanks. stuff because we need, we, need, we need better global health bioethics thinking and that you're, you're on your Thanks. way, it's great. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, um, about gender and sex work and the roles and lives of these women because it was yeah. the thing that I was feeling most surprised about as you were talking and most notably absent which I think was intentional or maybe not on your on your part to talk mm -hmm. about some of the ethical issues um, but the thing that struck me most was your phrase um, the we self must be maintained because in most places in the world the we self of the nation does not include sex workers right. and it doesn't include sex workers, particularly in a nation that's trying to reformulate itself after a huge national trauma and start looking better to the world of business. And you know, there are all these forces in neoliberalism and in everything to um, not own certain parts of one's population. And so yeah. your, your description of all of this sounds like remarkably unified and supportive and saying we are our sex workers. And in fact, we're gonna run our politics on saying we're gonna protect a group of people that are morally stigmatized in Buddhism, yeah. are morally stigmatized in the global economy mm -hmm. against these national interests that we have a lot of incentive to be supportive of. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to name that as remarkable and yeah. hear if you have any any more details about that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, both of these questions, I sex work, or sex work uh, in, as a was not the main focus of the research that I did, and it was it was a conscious choice um, because obviously it's a huge <laughs> important issue. The work that was going on, the context of PEPFAR, the post conflict kind of positioning of the sex worker as maybe the vehicle of HIV, right, from UN from the UN is one of the stories about that. But also the extreme vulnerability and marginality of sex workers, um, which the government, uh, many were very frustrated by the government speaking to, in, on behalf of sex workers because they felt that the government was actually a threat to sex workers through the police, but also through government policies. Um, later on, shutting brothels and those sorts of things. Um, so it's... And part of my decision about that was personal in that I had done work with injection drug users and sex workers, and I just felt like my time and contribution wanted to go elsewhere, frankly. So maybe that's not faithful enough to a situation, I don't know. But actually, the other reason was that there were other people writing about the sex work who were really deeply embedded within those organizations, um, Larissa Sandy and um, in Nigeria, Chris, Chris Peterson and others, and I, I felt they were doing a Great job. <laughs> um, and the, I guess I should mention the third reason when I've given this talk, I've shown a short clip about the, from CNN at the time with the founding of the WNU that is, 
it's just a problematic video, but it kind of shows how sex work was this sensationalized thing, right? So, so the trial becomes linked to the figure of the sex worker, and that's linked to prostitution and to trafficking and to corruption and all these things. And I see Hansen also like enough of this focus on this, like equivalent of Cambodia with this, right? Um, but I didn't interview Hun Sen, so I don't, I, and, and I wasn't out to kind of solve the deep question about the real reasons for cancellation, because that wasn't my position, really. But I, it's the sex worker and sex worker politics are crucial to this story, and uh, particularly at that moment, right? Um, and I wanted to ask yeah. a slightly related one, yeah. which is about human rights, which yeah. is we tend to think of human rights as protecting disempowered people from those with power. Yeah. Um, but you're pointing to something else, which is it sets up a conflict based, these, you know, the sex workers are not the state, the state is evil, the sex workers need protection from the state, and it starts to separate people into bins. Mm -hmm. Whereas Hun Sen is saying, g you know, get your discourse out of our country, we're mm -hmm. all one Cambodia, mm -hmm. which is a potentially a, an also way of decreasing of violence against a group subgroup of people. Mm -hmm. um, and do you feel like that's a, a part of this rethinking of bioethics that you're doing in a post-colonial context? Like, are you taking that seriously, <laughs> that human rights could be violent in a way that... Yeah, that the, the speaking for human rights is an act of violence sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. what do you think? Yeah. Uh, I do, I don't think saying human rights enacts human rights, right? I think th there's a complex politics of the speech. <laughs> it's not a speech act in that sense, right? But so I think that human rights, what I've tried to show a bit is that involves shifting kind of roles within it and that the violence can be kind of sucked out of it. <laughs> and then put back in at different times, I guess. So, you know, it, it, some of the early, I mean, maybe John can also talk about this, some of the early NGO work around human rights was about the violence of the state, right, and the military and elites, and then that's a, almost a, a fetishization of that violence, right, sometimes in some of the media about it, right, and then kind of sucking that out to say, actually, it's about the foreigners and the others. I think it's a really great point, but it's, I think we would do well to consider human rights as a complex field, right? Which isn't doing one thing <laughs> and, is, and isn't involved with sort of simple rights and wrongs, frankly, similar to ethics. I mean, a lot of science studies scholars have not wanted to study ethics because they feel like there's too much predetermination of groups, right? So it's analytically less interesting for some scholars that you, you already know what's good and bad, you already know who's this, there's the state and there's the sex workers. and. I left out of this talk, but there's, it's really important that they, there are other Cambodians here that were kind of in favor of the trial or trying to improve it. There were uh, foreign anthropologists who were trying to help the unions spread their voice at the same time. And so those fields can never be encapsulated in a press release or a speech, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to talk so much. No, it's okay. Thanks. Uh, Jen, I'm really interested in this idea about undue inducement and the conversation yeah. you had with your Australian colleague. Mm -hmm. So I've heard this raised in U.S. testing on human subjects in a couple ways. Number one, if the inducement is high enough, maybe you get people who uh, you have a biased sample or you've got people who falsify information in order to get into the uh, subject group. And then a different set of concerns which you alluded to that I'd like to ask you if, if this was part of the discussion in Cambodia, and that is the idea that if you have such an inducement on one side of the scale that, uh, that as in a sense, you throw off this cost-benefit calculus that's supposed to be informing decisions uh, because the costs become impossible to focus upon for someone who is in a position of, of need and who, who has such an inducement dangled in front of them. Uh, is that was, was that type of logic widely discussed in this context? And, and I'd be particularly interested also in hearing what some Cambodian uh, uh, voices had to say about that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the quote that I read from the physician epidemiologist is, mentions like if, if people don't have enough to eat and then we give them health insurance, they're going to join the trial. But in some ways, I think that quote, he was a wonderfully sensitive person who was really trying to grapple with what the research was doing, right? He was really concerned about trying to do the right thing. But that, that even that sentence, ta taken out of context a bit as it is, illustrates like you're talking about a place without 
a very good health care and then providing health care is a <laughs> this is this is needed right so it's it's a it's a really important demand to make and an ethical question um i didn't talk to many ngo folks or research cambodian ngo or f folks or researchers about that specific concept undue inducement that was more what the australian and us um spoke of and as sort of this is un this would be unethical. We're, t we're we're concerned about the ethics, and this would be unethical. Um, some of the Cambodian researchers at NCHADS talked about it in terms of there's no coercion, right, right. but the coercion wasn't unpacked in terms of the costs and benefits of the research per se. But I, um, yeah. Anyone else? I don't know if uh, maybe in the WAC was that concept discussed. I'm sorry, I didn't catch your name over there. Where, was the concept of undue di inducement discussed within the WAC? Yeah, absolutely. Uh huh. And how did how were folks talking about it there? Um, like uh, the, the, I mean the, the hostility uh, certainly within WAC was such that um, the only solution seemed to be to end the program. Yeah. Uh, and that may have been a function of the people on the ground who were actually distri distributing the drug and how they talked about it as a, as a substitute for condoms. Um, well, so it which, shouldn't which have been, been distributed really at that time, though. What? It, it wasn't a, a, the study wasn't actually active, though, was it? Or? Uh, no, yeah. and they were trying to recruit people. Right. Uh, but it hadn't been, I think it hadn't been. No, 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 I mean, the, the drug wasn't physically. Right, 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 people. that's what I'm um, It's interesting to think of those demand, the demand for 30 years of post-trial care, say in relationship to demands that we are also faced with, at least at my university and maybe at yours, to think about the demand um, for changes, right, and justice in education. I, I see interesting connections between kind of there's ways of making demands that are technical right like we want this type of a course or this type of a curriculum or this type of syllabus and then some that are more like i'm making a demand to blow it up right <laughs> and that's how i see and i see the a value to both of those kinds of demands and i see the 30-year thing is like this is this is not working kind of what you're saying let's blow it up and i i guess there's a this is there's a structure of the demand that is funct that is we can see in our moment right now, right in the U.S. Well, I think we've just about come to the end of our, our hour, so uh, please join me in thanking yeah, Sarah for thank her. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for your question.